I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Sometimes a sucker wins. Yes, we have that story for you. Come right over. <laughs> chair by the window. Comfortable? The manuscript is on this shelf. Here it is. Sometimes a sucker wins. The very exciting story of a girl who finds the key to her brother's disappearance and opens the door to murder. Let's take a look at it under the reading lamp. When Joan Adams arrived in the city, she felt uneasy, apprehensive. But the thought of turning back never occurred to her. She had a job to do. One that would require courage and patience. As soon as she'd obtained a room, she phoned District Attorney Nelson. District Attorney Nelson was a busy man. At least that's what his secretary told me every time I phoned. But I kept calling and finally she gave me an appointment. When I arrived there, Nelson made me wait almost an hour... Then his secretary ushered me into his office. For a few minutes, he pretended to be busy with the papers on his desk. Then he looked up at me. Now, Miss Adams, what did you want to see me about? My brother, Larry. Oh, you read the papers, didn't you? Yes, I read them. Well? The story they printed is a lie. I'm sorry, Miss Adams. I'm afraid I disagree with you. Look, Mr. Nelson, I've come all the way down here from Hillsboro because I think my brother is dead. I believe he was murdered. I see. And what makes you so sure he was murdered? I just know it, that's all. Oh, the feminine intuition test, eh? No, it's much more than that. I knew my brother better than anyone else in the world. He would never run away from anything. And he would never steal. No? Look, Miss Adams, your brother was my assistant in charge of an investigation into the building racket. Certain important files were in his care. One day, without a word to anyone, he disappears with the files and with every dollar he has in the bank. Doesn't that sound like a payoff to you? No, Larry couldn't be bribed. He just couldn't. I wish I could share your faith in your brother, Miss Adams, but I'm afraid the facts speak for themselves. Well, then, you won't help me? Help you? I should say not. Due to your brother's malfeasance, the integrity of this office has been impugned. I see. And if you get involved with me, it might hurt your chances for political advancement. How dare you insinuate such a thing? I'm here to represent the citizens of this city. The only thing. Oh, that... why don't you stop? What? Save that bilge for your campaign speeches. Why, I... Young lady, please leave this office at once. Don't worry, I'm leaving. But let me tell you this. I'm going to clear my brother's name if it's the last thing I do. When I walked out of the building, I turned right and went to the corner to get a bus back to my room. As I stood there, I noticed a green coupe parked behind the bus sign. There was a man at the wheel. As I looked in his direction, he pulled his hat brim low over his eyes and slouched down in his seat. Then the bus came along. I got in, sat down in the rear... After we started, I happened to glance out the rear window. I saw that green coupe pull slowly away from the curb. Just when I began to feel sure I was being followed, the coupe turned off the avenue on which we were traveling. When the bus stopped at my corner, I got off and began walking across the street to my rooming house. I was about halfway over when I heard the motor. I looked around just in time to see the car. Are you all right, miss? Yes, I, I guess so. Gee, that sure was a close shave. Yeah, sure was. I told myself it was an accident. But the car that almost ran me down, 
was a green coop. When I got up to my room, I was frightened and discouraged. I had only one clue. A month before, in a gossip column syndicated in the Hillsborough paper, Larry had been linked with Roxy Haver, the burlesque queen. When I'd written him about it, he'd laughed it off. I looked up Roxy Haver's number in the directory, and then I called her. Hello? Uh, hello, Miss Haver? Yeah. This is Joan Adams. Who? Joan Adams, Larry's sister. You, you, you remember my brother, don't you? Well, yeah. I guess everybody does. But, I mean, you knew him. Me? Whatever gave you that idea? Well, I, I read about it in Guy Gilmore's column, you know, about a month ago. Oh, that. That was just some publicity dreamed up by my press agent. But Larry wrote me it was true. Now, look, honey, maybe he did, but he was just stringing you. If I had a buck for every guy who claimed he went out with me, I'd have picked up more dough than stymie. I know, Sorry, but... honey, I gotta hang up now. Wait. Yeah? Miss Haver, you're the only lead I have. I've got to see you. Huh? I'm coming down to your hotel right now. Your what? Say, don't you understand English? I told you, I never knew your brother. I said I'm coming right down. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, I'll see you. You know where the Marcus Street subway station is, don't you? Yes. Okay, I'll meet you there in half an hour. I'll be near the newsstand at the rear of the platform. Right. Goodbye. Miss Haver? Yeah, yeah, keep your voice down, kid, and face the tracks. What's the matter? Nothing. I just want to keep my nose clean, that's all. Now, what do you want? You did know Larry, didn't you? Yeah. He went out with me a couple of times. Why? Huh? Oh, no, please don't misunderstand. You see, I, I know Larry didn't like making the rounds, nightclubs and things like that. He was on a job, wasn't he? Search me. All he told me was that he liked my company. Are you sure? Positive. Then why did you deny knowing him? Look, honey, i got to watch my steps, see? Publicity's okay, but not in a caper like this. Oh, I, I don't know. I was so sure you could help me. Uh-huh, I understand. Listen, honey, I'm going to give you a good tip. Go yes. on home and forget about this mess. Well, it's easy for you to say. It wasn't your brother. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going to keep digging till I get the truth. Okay, honey, do what you want. Only don't call me, and whatever you do, don't come near my hotel. So long, kid. <laughs> I watched Roxy go up the subway steps. I turned and walked to the front of the platform to wait for a train. All right, everybody, take it easy. Keep back. Keep back, will you? The platform was crowded and everyone surged forward. Then just when the train was coming into the station, someone in the rear pushed me. Hey, what's the matter with you, miss? You're trying to get yourself killed? Well, well, you, someone pushed me. Huh? Who? I don't know. You don't know, eh? If you ask me, I think you were trying to jump, but you lost your nerve. Right. Well, you're crazy. Not me, sister. Now, come on, beat it before I call a cop. Come on, get going. That subway guard didn't know it, but he'd given me an idea. I went down to police headquarters. When I told the desk sergeant my name, he sent me in to a Lieutenant Calvin. Calvin listened to my story in silence. His eyes were cold, skeptical. That's quite a story, Miss Adams. But it's true, every word of it. I'm not saying it isn't. But even assuming the facts, there's the possibility that both incidents were accidental. Oh, but I tell you, they couldn't have been accidents. Someone is trying to prevent me from finding out what really happened to my brother. I know what happened to him. Y you do? Yeah. You see, you were sent to me because I'm in charge of the Larry Adams case. Your brother was paid off, and now he's hiding out. You too, huh? Yeah, me too. I'm convinced of it. Of course, and you couldn't possibly be wrong, could you? No. Miss Adams, I'll let you in on a little secret. A report's in that your brother's been seen in Mexico. I don't believe it. If Larry were alive, he'd communicate with me in some way. Not if he were wanted. I tell you, he would. Have it your own way. You know, Miss Adams, you've been annoying quite a few officials by poking around in this matter. 
I thought I'd put you wise so you wouldn't waste your time. I'm not wasting my time. I'm determined to clear my brother's name. Maybe so. But if you're smart, you'll catch the next train home. That sounds like a warning, Lieutenant. It is. You see, I'd hate to see a pretty girl like you get hurt. After seeing Lieutenant Calvin, I was more determined than ever to vindicate my brother. Calvin had done nothing to encourage me, except in one way. I was annoying people with my poking around. Perhaps I'd annoy the right person. A few days later, I got a telephone call. Hello? Hello, is this Joan Adams? Yes. Who who, who is this? Never mind. I understand you want to know something about your brother. Yes? I know something, baby. Hello, you still there? Yes, yes, I'm here. It's just that I... What did you want to tell me? That's so fast, baby. I don't talk on the phone. Oh, well, where can I see you? There's a little place called the Blue Swan at South and Main. Meet me there tonight at 7.30. I know what you look like. Just sit in a booth and wait, okay? Yes. Uh, just one little thing. I don't want any other company. What do you mean? Don't invite any cops. I don't like them. Don't worry. Neither do I. Good. Okay, see you tonight. Hello, Miss Adams. Oh. What's the matter, baby? Oh, nothing. I, I didn't see you come in. Oh? No. I was in the back watching you. Come along. Yes? I hope so. I thought I saw a guy hanging around outside. I swear I haven't spoken to the police. Yeah? You know, with those big blue eyes of yours, you could make me believe anything. Shall we talk? Okay. The name's Griffo. Griffo? Yeah. Don't mean nothing to you, huh? Ever hear of Augie Strecker? I think so. I've seen his name mentioned in the papers. Uh Uh-huh. Every time something happens that ain't kosher, the papers like to hint maybe Augie has something to do with it. You know what? He has. Did he have... Did he have anything to do with my brother's disappearance? Oh, that's asking a lot, baby. You see, I, uh... I work for Augie. Oh. But don't get me wrong. Sometimes when you work, you... uh, You ain't satisfied with your pay. I see. Well, I have some money, not much, but maybe I could... Wait a minute. What's the matter? You sure you didn't tip off the cops? Yes, why? I thought I saw that guy again through the window. I don't see anybody. Well, maybe not, baby. You know, talking to you ain't exactly healthy for a lot of reasons. I don't like it here. Where can we go? I don't know. We can't go to my place. I live at one of Augie's hotels. Cops keeping tab on you where you live? I don't think so, but... But what? Nothing. I want to hear about my brother. Okay. I got my car outside. Let's go over to your place. All right. We got into Griffo's car and started off. He didn't say anything, just drove rapidly, doubling on our tracks until at last we reached my rooming house. Griffo was silent till the door of my room closed behind me. Yeah. Now maybe we'll be alone. What are you looking for? Just checking to see that you haven't planted a listening device or two. Well? Okay, you're clean. Uh, Mind if, uh, if I sit on this sofa with you? No. Thanks. I'll just put this heater on the coffee table. You know, just in case. Do you always carry a gun? Yeah, it comes in handy. Well, let's talk. You were saying that you haven't got much dough. No, I haven't. Just about $800. At all? Yes, but maybe I could raise some more. How much? I don't know. I'd have to have time. That's not so good. Uh... Anybody ever tell you you're a looker? No. 
cut it out. You don't have to play cute with me. Come here. Oh, please. You know, baby, money ain't everything. Now, maybe we can work this no, out. No, please. I'll get the money. Forget the I... dough. Now, come on, baby. You don't want to play hard to get, do I you? I said don't. All right. Give me that gun. Give it to me. Ah! It was only after he fell that I felt the gun in my hand. I stared at it, and then I dropped it. I sat watching the red stain on Griffo's shirt. I don't know how long I sat there. Suddenly there was a knock on the door. I stood, but I couldn't walk. Then the door opened man came in. Big man with a hawk-like face. It was only when he closed the door, I noticed he held a gun. He looked at Griffo and at me. Then he put away his gun. I see you beat me to the punch, Miss Adams. Who are you? I'm Strecker. Augie Strecker. Oh, you poor kid. Guess you never killed anybody before, did you? Well, you did a good job. You know, I want to thank you. Thank me? Yeah. For Griffo here. You saved me the bother. I... I didn't mean to kill him. No? He's dead. I was fighting with him. The gun went off. I see. Uh, Look, I know a little about murder. Better make up a better story. That one will sound phony to a jury. A jury? Sure. They try it for shooting people. Remember? Now, this thing looks bad. You invite a man up to your room, someone you think had something to do with your brother. How did you know that? Well, it's my business to know everything. Anyway, as I was telling you, you're up here with a guy you think can help you. You threaten him with a gun. He doesn't talk. You kill him. Yeah. Looks bad. But that, that isn't what happened. Sure, I know. But who's going to believe you? What should I do? Well, you did me a favor knocking him off. I'll help you get rid of the body and get you out of town. No, but shouldn't I report this? Okay. Do it your way. So long. Wait. What do you want? Help me. Help me get rid of him. I packed my suitcases and carried them down to Griffo's car. I brought back a lap robe. Then I returned to the car and sat in the front seat. Soon I saw Strecker in the vestibule, carrying a dark bundle. He came out hurriedly, crossed the sidewalk, and opened the rear door of the car. He put the body in. The legs dangled. And he tucked them in, covered Griffo with the robe, and leaned the suitcases against him. He slammed the door shut, got in alongside of me. And we drove off. <laughs> come from Hillsborough, don't you? Yes. I'll drive you to the Westbridge Station. We'll just about make the 923. What? What, what are you going to do with Griffo? Oh, don't worry about that. I always take good care of anybody who tries to double-cross me. Oh, well, by the way, Miss Adams, I'm buying you a one-way ticket to your hometown. Understand? Yes. Good. Something tells me you've got a lot more sense than poor Griffo. Strecker handled the wheel with a reckless disregard of traffic lights and a contempt for other drivers. There was one moment when I thought the car would overturn. It was at the railway crossing when we swerved to avoid hitting the gateman. When we reached the station, Strecker stopped the car, well out of the range of the lights there. Then he got out. You wait here. I'll get your ticket. All right. Please hurry back. Okay. Take it easy. He glanced in the rear of the car and then walked to the station. I felt like jumping out at the car and running. 
But I remembered what Strecker had said. And the way he looked when he said it. Then I heard footsteps approaching. I was glad to hear them. They stopped at the car and I looked up. Hello, Miss Adams. It was Lieutenant Calvin. He was standing there with his hand on the window watching me. And he looked into the rear of the car. Leaving town? Yes. Kind of sudden, isn't it? I guess so. You know, I went over to your house to see you. From what I saw there, I gathered you were leaving us. I I didn't have much time to pack. I wanted to make the train. I see. I figured you'd be taking this one. I tore out here in a prowl car to catch you. Just about made it, didn't I? Yes. What do you want? Well, it's about your brother. My brother? Yeah. Remember that report I mentioned about his having been seen in Mexico? Well, they checked on it, and it's not true. Just one of those things. Oh. What's the matter? I thought I'd be in for at least a strong I told you so. No. As a matter of fact, Lieutenant, I've decided that you were right. You have? Yes, I guess I've just been foolish about things. And that's why I'm going home. Uh, I'm sorry you're leaving. Anything uh, wrong, Miss Adams? What? No, Mr. Strecker, not at all. Hello, Augie. Hello. I didn't expect to find you here. No? Uh, here's your ticket, Miss Adams. Thank you. Was there anything you wanted, Lieutenant? No, Augie. Not right now. And suppose you leave us alone. Okay. I'll be seeing you. Oh, and uh, maybe you too, Miss Adams. So long. Calvin began walking away. And then he stopped. He looked at the rear of the car and started to walk back. Uh, Stricker. Yeah? Your taillight is out. If I were you, I'd have it fixed. I wouldn't want to have to pull you in, you know. Thank you, Lieutenant. From a distance, I finally heard Lieutenant Calvin drive off. I was still shaking. It was the sound of the train arriving that steadied me a little. Strecker got my suitcases out of the car. Well, Miss Adams, I guess you better get moving. May I have my bags, please? Oh, don't you want me to carry them for you? No, thanks. I'd rather not. Okay. Goodbye, Miss Adams. I didn't answer him. I just took my suitcases and walked to the train. I could feel Strecker's eyes watching me until I got on. I found a seat next to a woman. It was on the side facing the station. I kept my head down till the train started. Then I looked out of the window. The car was gone. Are you feeling all right, miss? What? I said, are you all right? You know, you look kind of shaky. No, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm just a bit tired. Oh, gone far? Hillsboro. Hillsboro. I hear that's a nice little town. Yes, it's nice. I like small towns. It's much better than living in the city, I always say. It's more, well, more neighborly. Don't you think so? But I, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. Oh, that's all right. I know how it is. Sometimes a person doesn't feel like saying a word. Perhaps you'd like to read. Wait, uh, I have a book. Here it is. Don't bother. Oh, nonsense. It's no bother. Go ahead, take it. It's awfully interesting. It's about a murder. What? Why, what's the matter? Where are you going? I got up and walked unsteadily down the car. The wheels of the train must have been listening to what that woman said, because they repeated it. A murder, a murder, a murder, a murder, a murder. I couldn't breathe and suddenly the wheels screamed. The train shuddered and flung me to the floor. My head hit the top of the seat. Hello. 
was lost in darkness. When I opened my eyes, I had to close them again. The light was too bright. And I thought I'd seen a face very close. A face which didn't belong there. I waited a while. And then I slowly opened my eyes again. A man was bending over me. It was... Lieutenant Calvin. Take it easy, Miss Adams. Where, where am I? In a hospital. Oh, but don't worry. The doctors assure me you're all right. You may have a bump where you struck your head, but it's nothing serious. The train. Well, what happened? Well, there was a collision. You were knocked unconscious and brought back here. I, I can't stay here. I've got to leave town right away. I'm afraid that's impossible for the time being. Why? You said yourself I was all right. Oh, it's not that, Miss Adam. You see, the train you were on collided with a car. A car? Yeah. A car driven by Strucker. Strucker? He couldn't have disposed of Griffo's body. There wasn't time. Calvin was staring at me with his cold eyes. You see, Miss Adams, on his way back from the station where the road cuts across the tracks, Strucker tried to beat the train to the crossing. He lost. Tell me, do you feel well enough to get out of bed and get dressed? Yes. Okay. I'll be waiting for you outside in the corridor. It didn't take me very long, considering everything. When I came out into the hall, I guess I swayed a little. Lieutenant Calvin reached out to take my arm, but I shook him off. Well, where do we go from here? To headquarters? No, we won't have to go that far. You just have to cross the hall into that room. A friend of yours is in there. I walked slowly to the door and opened it. There was a screen around the bed. I entered the room, closed the door. It seemed years before I walked behind that screen... What do you say, baby? Griffo! Yeah, it's me in person. I'm a hard guy to kill, ain't I? Now look, baby, I haven't much time. I want you to listen. Yes? Up in your room. I was talking to you about your brother. Y- yes? Strecker had him bumped off. <laughs> Augie had Roxy Haver get in touch with him. She played it like she was a stoolie with info to sell. I told him to keep it quiet. Your brother was a sucker for it. He's in the river, near the bridge. Did, did, did you... Did you tell this to the police? No. But don't worry, baby, they're listening now. He made a gesture with his head, and I saw the wire along the wall. There was a listening device in the room. I don't care this time. Is Strecker dead? Yeah. He always was a lousy driver. I told him to let me take the wheel. But how could you? With that bullet in you. Bullet. (laughs) That's good. That's a hot one. I thought you were wise by now. Wise? Yeah. It was like the green coop and that subway job. You see, up in your room, we gave a performance. Blank cartridge and a red stain to bluff a sucker out of the game. But you know, baby... Sometimes a sucker wins. And so closes tonight's story, Sometimes a Sucker Wins. James Erthine wrote the radio script. Roger Bauer produced and directed. Joan Tompkins played the part of Joan. The cast included Sidney Smith, Larry Haynes, Arthur Vinton, Cameron Prudhomme, and Anne Loring. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. This is the Crime Club. I'm the librarian. 
Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have the very intriguing story of a fish that told a story of murder. It's called Fish for Entree. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there's a new Crime Club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Thank you.